It's episode 98 of the Keto for Women show. You're listening to the Keto for Women show. This podcast provides the tools you need to create your own expression of a healthy ketogenic lifestyle so you can stop obsessing and start living. I'm your host and nutritionist, Sean Miner. Now let's get on with the show. We've got yet another brand to spotlight in this episode, and it's an important one because most of us are not thinking through the quality of the olive oil we are using. It's so important. I actually had no idea either until I became a nutritional therapy practitioner and understood how sensitive these fat sources are. In order to get the nutritional profile that we need and expect from olive oil, it has to be made from properly sourced olives that were harvested at the right time and with the right processing, that safe and gentle. And not only that, they are very sensitive to heat and light and need to be packaged appropriately too, which means a dark colored glass bottle. Now that I know this, when I walk through the olive oil section of the grocery store and see all of the clear plastic bottles, I get worried that's not the way it should be for the foods we are consuming, specifically the olive oil. The family behind Cassandrino's olive oil gets all of this. Growing up in Greece, they were surrounded by only the best olive oil and have now brought that pure Greek olive oil to the masses. They single source their olives from Laconia, Greece, where the olives are gently pressed within 24 hours of harvest, so each bottle is as fresh as it gets. This means you are actually getting the high nutrient level that olive oil should have with the assurance it hasn't been damaged like many olive oils out there. And you can taste the difference. Cassandrino's olive oil has incredible flavor and a super smooth consistency. It's a beautiful color too, which means it's high in nutrients. And you just don't see that in other olive oils these days. It's worth it to know more about your olive oil and invest in the highest quality you can find. Cassandrino's is that company for me, and maybe it will be for you too. Support this family-owned and operated company who's doing it right in a sea of big brands doing it all wrong. Head to seanminer.com slash olive oil to shop Cassandrino's olive oil. That's seanminer.com slash olive oil. Hey, hey, friends. Welcome back. Thanks, as always, for joining me on this episode of Keto for Women. We're on to the fourth of the best of Keto for Women show over the past 100 episodes. And today we're taking it back to episode number 26 with Dr. Ken Berry, who was one of the most loved guests I have ever had on this show. You guys were telling me how much you loved Dr. Berry for weeks after that one aired. So I want to listen to it again and see what else you pick up on now that it's been a little while since we've heard from Dr. Berry. He spent the hour talking to me all about hormones and what your doctor is missing when it comes to your hormones. There's a lot of us out there as women struggling with our hormones. We go to the doctor and we get absolutely no help. As a medical doctor, Dr. Barry's doing it differently. He's teaching us more about those hormones, what we need to ask our doctors and look for in ourselves all in this episode. Let's have a listen. Dr. Ken Berry is a board-certified family physician practicing in a small town in rural America. After practicing more than a decade and seeing more than 20,000 patients, Dr. Berry has seen the best and worst that is American medical practice. He is a lucky husband, proud father, and full-time practicing doctor. Dr. Berry and his beautiful wife, Nisha, live in their farm in Tennessee. And Dr. Barry has a lot of information to share with us today. He also has a book called Lies My Doctor Told Me, which you can get on Amazon, and you can learn more about what he does in his practice at theberryclinic.com. And we will link to all of that in the show notes. But without further ado, let's chat with Dr. Barry. Dr. Barry, thank you so much for coming on Keto for Women today. Hey, Sean. Thanks a lot for having me. And you are a very special guest because I don't know if you know this, you're the first ever man on the Keto for Women show. Well, that is quite an honor. (laughs) Yeah. I mean that. Yeah. Thank you for having me. 
Well, I know that you have quite the brain to pick, and I'm very excited to have you here to be able to clear up some of these issues that we as women have, and very excited also to get the view of a medical doctor who believes in a ketogenic diet, because as you probably agree with me, there's not very many of you out there. There's not many at all, and I was talking on another podcast the other day about this. It feels like if you're in this community that... This is just common sense and commonplace, and everyone believes this way. But there was a recent professor who did a PowerPoint presentation about this, and the paleo primal ketogenic diets actually have never been heard of by about 90% of the U.S. and Canadian population. But if you say those words, they're like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe vaguely I've heard of that, but I really have no idea what you're talking about. So I think we're in a wonderful place right now that we can bring this wonderful idea and treatment and therapy into the mainstream and help millions of people who have never heard of it before. Yes, I totally agree. We're right at that spot right now. So it's a great time to be talking about it. Okay, so first, let's back up and why don't we get to know you a little bit? So tell everyone who you are, a little bit about yourself, and we'll go from there. Sure. I'm a board certified family physician and I practice in a very small rural town in Tennessee in the United States. And I've been practicing for about 13 years now, seeing about 22,000 unique patients over my practice career, do family medicine in a small rural community. And that means that there are no specialists nearby. So I kind of have to branch out and be good at lots of things, lots of procedures. So when it comes to gynecological things, dermatological things, even some general surgery type things, I do a lot of that. Wow. You're a jack of many trades. (laughs) Exactly right. Yeah. And because often if I can't do what the patient needs done, then it means a two hour drive right to a metropolitan city, you know, to get that seen to by a specialist. So over the years, I've tried to, if it's any way within my sphere of practice, I try to incorporate that into my practice just to save my patients time, money and inconvenience. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, so then let's switch roles and talk more about this ketogenic lifestyle that we are promoting today and why I have a whole podcast. But tell me your backstory with that and how you kind of got started and got interested in this the whole way of food being a medicine that you could use as well in your practice. It's quite an interesting story. I started out, I'm classically trained allopathic physician. And so like most of us, I got about one half semester's worth of training on the entirety of human nutrition in my medical school training. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But all all of us in general don't get much training on nutrition, on diet, on health at all in our medical school training. And I think that's definitely in the U.S. and probably in Canada and other Western countries as well. But when I got out of residency and I started my practice, I started, you know, I was into my 30s and I started to gain weight. And it got a little out of hand. And one day when I was trying to tie my shoes and I got short of breath, I thought, you know, this is really bad because I like to be the guy that leads by example. I don't like to say, well, yeah, you do as I say, not do as I do. And so I thought, well, I need to fix this. And so I'm going to start practicing what I preach because I've just been eating whatever, you know, not not living any kind of a lifestyle at all because I was very busy building a practice. And so I got up in the attic and I got down all of my nutrition notes from my medical school years. And I I brought them down to study them so I could remember exactly what I needed to do to get this weight off and to lower my hemoglobin A1C, which was rising, to lower my triglycerides, which are going up. I was right on the verge of being a type 2 diabetic at that time. And so your listeners may be imagining this huge pile of huge textbooks and notes and stuff. But the entirety of my training on human nutrition in medical school, I could hold easily in one hand. Mm. And so that kind of gives you an idea of how little training we got. And But anyway, I got it down. I went through it all. And I said, okay, so I'm going to start eating, eating lots more whole grain. I'm going to eat lots of carbs. I'm going to really cut out the saturated fat, and I'm going to start jogging. That was my plan to lose weight. And so I did that. And, you know, when I give patients instructions, here, go do this. I have no way of really knowing if they really actually do it or not. But in my case, I knew that I did these things. I really did cut out the saturated fat, and I really did start eating whole grain, and I really did start doing all these things, and I started jogging. 
And about two months later, I jumped on the scales and I had gained 10 pounds. Oh, my gosh. And at that point, that was kind of my realization. Okay, so basically everything I've been telling everyone else to do and then suspecting that they secretly weren't doing it because they were bad patients. I've been giving them the wrong advice because it obviously doesn't work, because like I said, I know I've been doing it and it didn't work. So it was really a wake up call for me that I was that fat doctor going into the room and telling people how to lose weight. And the advice I was giving them was exactly wrong. Mm hmm. And so I still, to this day, apologize every opportunity I get for giving that terrible medical advice for the first few years of my practice. I mean, I was just parroting what I'd been taught and never had I thought about it, never had I researched it, never had I tried to apply it in my own life. And that's another thing I like to talk about is why there are fat doctors. And it's not because they're not dedicated and hardworking. They are. But it's because what they think works doesn't work. Right. And so when I failed so completely at trying to get in better shape, I started looking around because obviously what I'd been taught in medical school did not work. So I started looking around and I found a tattered old copy of Robert Adkins, Adkins diet. And I bought that, I think for 50 cents. <laughs> I did some more research and I found the primal blueprint by Mark Sisson mm -hmm. and I found the paleo solution. And I found a couple other books like that. And I started reading and that made so much more sense to me immediately than what I was taught in medical school, which was basically eat more whole grains. And so I just literally memorized those books and applied that to my life. And I started to lose very easily and very noticeably. My triglycerides came down. My hemoglobin A1C returned to normal. I could tie my shoes without getting short of breath again. It was pretty cool. And I stopped the jogging. I found that that really didn't serve any purpose whatsoever. And when I researched it, the research basically shows that that's a terrible way to lose weight. So I stopped <laughs> that as well. But as a culmination of, and I think that the paleo and the primal and the ancestral diets are wonderful. And I still use them in patients who are trying to maintain. But if you're trying to lose weight, if you're trying to lower your triglycerides and lower your A1C, I just don't think there's a better diet in the world than what I ultimately discovered was the ketogenic diet of making those things happen in a very healthy way, but also in a very quick way and in a way that doesn't involve spending a lot of time or a lot of money. And so that's when I fell in love with the ketogenic diet and decided, you know, there's really no better diet for any patient who's trying to lose weight for their health. Oh, I love it. That's so great. What a good story. And great that you have your own personal experience with it, too. That's really how all of us got here, I think, in this community is our own success story with this type right. of eating, which is awesome. Okay, so then someone comes into your practice that is overweight and the ketogenic diet, you basically prescribe it to them. Pretty much, yeah. And, and I usually in two or three office visits, I'll try to start with the very most basic concepts because you know as well as I do when you say to people that, you know, fat is not what made you fat. Mm -hmm. It's like cognitive dissonance. You should be speaking Italian. They don't even understand what you're saying at all. Right. And you have to repeat that several times before it finally clicks. And they're like, oh, you mean fat didn't make me fat. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I said 20 times. But, <laughs> yeah, but exactly. literally the first time you say it, they're nodding and smiling, but they didn't hear what you said. Mm -hmm. They can't hear that because their paradigm has to be shifted because they believe with all their heart very fervently that fat will make you fat. You should avoid that and you should eat more whole grains and you should eat low fat, high carb. I mean, they believe that to the very depths of their soul. And so you literally have to shift their paradigm as a thinking human before they can even accept this information and definitely before they can even start to act on it. So it's a very interesting human nature dance, trying to crack open their brain and slide something in before it slams shut again. And that's kind of what I do the first two or three visits as I'm laying down kind of the, the groundwork theories of the ketogenic diet. And then after the third or fourth visit, they start to catch on and they've done some reading and then they're really starting to get into it because they've lost 10 or 15 pounds and their numbers are starting to return to normal. And that's when they fall in love with it. And they, they become what I call an apostle. And they start spreading the word and telling their neighbors and friends, oh, man, this diet rocks. But when you first start talking about it, you've probably seen it before. Someone just nodding and smiling and they literally couldn't repeat back what you just said because their brain won't hear it yet. Right. It's not ready. 
Right, exactly. Yeah, and that, that's very common. And so oftentimes I feel like I'm spinning my wheels the first visit or two, but I'm not. We're laying the groundwork. I don't know if it's subconscious or what, but it takes a few times of hearing it before they can even really truly hear it. Yes, I completely agree. That's why repetition is actually a good thing in these kinds of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about more about weight loss, gaining weight, inability to lose weight, especially as it pertains to women, because I think we have a lot of women listeners out there that are in one of those categories where either they're trying keto and they're not losing weight or they're perhaps gaining weight. Do you ever see that in your practice? And what can we kind of attribute to some of that difficulty of us ladies and our weight? Well, ladies actually have a, a bit harder of a time than men because ultimately weight loss is a hormonal issue almost entirely. And I'm about to say something that some of your listeners probably aren't ready to hear yet, but calories, calories in, calories out, calorie deficit, all of that is a myth. None of that's true. None are, of that will help you lose weight. You are so it, speaking it, my mean, language it, right now. <laughs> <This is laughs> but I, I guarantee you there's a new listener or two who's going, wait, what did you say? Mm -hmm. You said the calorie, what? Yeah, because, I mean, for years in my practice early on, I would say, oh, it's simple. All you have to do is burn more calories than you eat. That equals weight loss. It's boom. There you go. You're welcome. But yep. That it literally has nothing to do with it at all. It's a false paradigm that we've all been operating under for the last 50 or 60 years. And, it, and as we can look at the burgeoning epidemics of obesity and type 2 diabetes, that advice doesn't work. It's actually backwards. It, it, it doesn't help. It actually hurts patients. And so I stopped even mentioning calories a few years ago. Because it cloudies the water. It has nothing to do with how the body loses weight. Ultimately, weight gain and weight loss are controlled by hormones. The predominant hormone is insulin. The next most powerful hormone for weight gain or weight loss is cortisol. And then you get into the thyroid hormones. And then you get into the gender or sex hormones. And when you've got all of those where they need to be, the weight loss is effortless. But you have to get them where they need to be. And in order to get them there, you have to test and you have to see where everything is. And then and I tell women, it's like a five piece band. If the drummer is awesome, but the guitar player sucks, it's not going to be a good night of music, no matter how great the drummer is. Mm -hmm. And so if we fix your estrogen and we ignore your thyroid and your progesterone and your testosterone and everything else, you might feel a little better, but you're not going to feel like you want to feel and the weight won't return to your ideal weight like it should. So, so I try to help people understand that the calories stop that. Don't even say that word because it literally has nothing to do with how human beings gain or lose weight. It's all about hormones and all about what you eat. Those are the things you got to focus all your energy on or ultimately you're just spinning your wheels. And so it sounds like you're also someone on the same track thinking wise where you have seen in your practice that the ketogenic diet does help to balance out some of these hormones. Absolutely. Yeah. If your diet is not right, then I can optimize every hormone that you have through whatever means. And you're not going to feel like you should feel and your body's not going to behave and, and listen to you like it should. And it's not going to respond to the foods you eat. If you're not eating the right foods, nothing's going to respond because basically, and it's, it seems very simple minded to say this, but I don't think people realize this. Your body is literally made of what you've eaten over the last 18 months. Mm. Your body is constantly turning over cells. It's like your skin, for example. You don't even have the same skin that you had two months ago. You have a completely new skin. The scars stay and the, and the damage stays, but the cells themselves are all new. And they didn't magically appear. They had to come from somewhere. And it, they came from the food that you ate. And so if you want the cells that you're about to build, to be optimal and really help you out, you have to eat the right food. That's not optional. That's mandatory. And so the number one thing is you got, you've got to fix your diet as a patient and as a human. And then I, as a doctor, have to check and then help you optimize the other hormones to get you all the way there. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Okay, so let's talk more about these specific hormones that you mentioned that us ladies have a hard time kind of optimizing. So you mentioned the first one was insulin. That's the yes. the primary driver. And if we 
can maintain our weight, if we gain weight, or if we have weight loss resistance, that's going to be the first one to look at, correct? Exactly right. That is when it comes to weight gaining, weight loss, the insulin level and your insulin response, that's the queen of the show. Without your insulin being optimized and low, you'll never lose weight because when, when the, your body's insulin level is elevated, it programs your body to store sugar into triglycerides and ultimately into fat, and that's how you gain weight. And so that's why we see in type 2 diabetics, when they start insulin, they always gain weight. It's not optional. It's just it's going to happen. And then that, in turn, makes their diabetes worse. Then they have to use more insulin. And so it's kind of a never-ending cascade of disease that leads slowly and painfully ultimately to death. And so, yeah, the insulin is totally in charge of the weight gain, weight loss. And I think it's pretty common knowledge that a ketogenic diet is a great place to start with healing that. But what do people need to do in order to know if that's an issue for them or or not? They probably need to go see their doctor and get some blood work done. Yeah, definitely. You should start there. And I write about how, you know, you need to find a doctor who's your learned health partner. That's how this relationship should work. Too many doctors want to be your your health dictator. And that's not going to help you ultimately, because the problem with that model is that you live in your own skin and you know your own symptoms and you know how you feel and you're kind of a unique individual. And so not everything works for every person the same exact way. And so you bring your experiences and your knowledge of your symptoms as a patient, and then that's got to blend with your doctor and his knowledge as a doctor so that you guys can work as a, as a partnership. The dictator model just doesn't work. And so many doctors try to practice that way because it tends to keep office visits short. You know, they're, we're all squeezed for time, and it tends to keep them in control and in, and in charge, which is where some doctors like to live. But I don't mind it if patients have done a lot of research and they and they've done a lot of thinking about their health because that actually makes me very happy because it tells me that they're motivated, they're ready to learn, and they're ready to change. But without a doctor you can trust and who treats you as a partner, you're probably not going to have much luck when you go. So yeah, you need to have some stuff checked. You need to talk to your doctor and make sure that he's not necessarily on board with the ketogenic diet. All you need is a doctor who's open to looking and just say, hey, I want you to read about this. Would you please do that for me? And if your doctor kind of swells up, as we say down in the South, and it's like, nah, I don't have time for that, then you may need to find a new doctor. But if your doctor's like, yeah, I'll check it out and we'll talk about it next time, then that's that's a good sign that you may have a good partnership there you can build on. I love that advice. That's so important to have this really good connection and communication with your doctor and not just this thing where they come in and talk at you for five minutes, give you a prescription and leave. You need to be something that's a little bit deeper and you need to come in with the knowledge of what you want and what you want to see from your partnership. So I think that's really important to point out. So thanks for doing that. Okay. So insulin's the the first thing. Then you mentioned cortisol. And this is one I really see women struggle with. I think that you'll agree. Absolutely. We have an issue yeah, here <laughs> with stress. And cortisol can, yeah, absolutely. And, and I try to break it up because there's actually good stress and then there's bad stress. And, you know, good stress is trying to, to increase your maximum deadlift or trying to run the 100-yard dash faster than you ever have before. Those are stressful things, but it's a good stress. It helps you. It helps your body to grow. So, But then the, the bad stress, the stress that many, many women suffer from is the stress of being stuck in a situation that they feel like they can't do anything about or they truly can't do anything about. That's a stress that's not a healthy stress. If you're stuck in a job that you, you must have, but yet you hate, that's a stressor on your system. And that tends to make your cortisol level be chronically high, too high. If you have to work shift work, second shift, third shift, you know, the midnight shift to make the extra money, you kind of feel like you're stuck. You, you need that money. But at the same time, that's terrible for your long-term health to work night shift like that, unless you're one of the very few people who, who is truly a night owl. Your body will not flourish in that environment. If you're stuck in a relationship that you know that you shouldn't be in, but yet you're kind of stuck in, that's a very stressful thing. And that can give you chronically elevated cortisol level, which can lead ultimately to weight gain and to just depression, poor mental health, and ultimately disease. So is cortisol, does that act kind of the same way as insulin, where it's almost kind of signals for your body to store fat? It's quite a bit different biochemically, different pathways. 
But the ultimate result is, is that if your cortisol level is elevated, you're going to turn off any weight loss that may be happening. Mm -hmm. Your body's going to tend to want to hold weight. It's going to want to put weight on because I tell patients, think back 30,000 years, everything we're doing. You can, I can always say, let's go back 30,000 years and look at your grandmother times 200 generations. When mm -hmm. she was chronically in stress like that, then it wasn't that she was in danger of just having a sucky life. It was that she was in danger of dying or that her, her offspring were in danger of dying. That was the stress back then. And so if you're chronically in that kind of stress, your body knows that, well, there, there's either a famine or there's a family of saber-toothed tigers who've moved in next door so we can't go out and forage for food. And so we're in real danger of starving to death here. So we need to hold every bit of energy we can. And the way the human body holds energy is to deposit it as fat on your booty, on your belly, or even worse, mm -hmm. in your liver or your pancreas. That's how we hold energy. And that's what we would have done 30,000 years ago if there was some kind of chronic daily stress like a famine or a flood or something like that, you had to hold all your energy. And so that's why it tends to promote weight gain rather than weight loss if you're in just a chronic stressful situation. Such a good explanation. So true. Okay, now we're moving on to the next rung, which were your thyroid hormones. And so tell us a little bit about how these thyroid hormones work, because I also know there are many women listening that have been diagnosed with hypothyroid and don't really know where to go from there. Yeah. And first, let's talk about the huge population of women who have a low thyroid or hypothyroidism, but have never been to the doctor or worse still, who have been to the doctor and had a test called a TSH check, just one test, and then told, oh, your thyroid's fine. It must just be in your head. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about those women first, because that's the real travesty here. That, yes. I mean, that, that to me is malpractice. And a doctor should be ashamed of himself if he's been practicing that kind of medicine. The thyroid gland is, is one of the most complicated glands in the human body. A lot of people call it the master gland. And I don't know if I agree with that terminology, but it is eminently important in your metabolism, in your mental health, in your physical health, in whether you gain or lose weight or not. It's intimately connected with thousands of biochemical reactions in your body. And if your thyroid is suboptimal, then everything is going to be suboptimal. And so, yeah, if, if you went to your doctor and you had the symptoms of low thyroid, which are weight gain or it's hard to lose weight, I'm cold all the time, I tend to be more constipated all the time, I feel like my hair and my skin are really dry, I think my hair is falling out way more than it should be, I feel like the outer one-third part of my eyebrows is for some reason getting really thin, I feel like I'm I'm holding fluid, I'm holding fat, and I just feel miserable. I feel terrible. I don't something's just not right. If any of that stuff rung a bell with you as a listener, then you need to have your thyroid checked. And to do that, there's a full panel of thyroid labs that need to be checked. TSH is one of them, but the TSH is actually not a thyroid hormone at all. It's a hormone that comes from the anterior pituitary gland, which is in your brain. And it tells your thyroid to make thyroid hormone, but it's not a thyroid hormone at all. So if the doctor checks your TSH and that's it, he really hasn't checked your thyroid at all. Mm -hmm. And so that's very important. And, and there's a, a website that I tell all women to go to. It's called Stop the Thyroid Madness. Yeah, that's a great and one. It's, uh, it's a great website. And I've sent hundreds of women there and a few men to to go and learn about, especially if they're out of town and I can't be their doctor, so that they can take a list. I want these labs checked, please. And I always say it respectfully because the doctor ultimately is the doctor. But if he refuses to check that list of labs, you need to find a new doctor because he's closed-minded and he's not going to hear anything you have to say. But there's a complete list of labs, and even some endocrinologists get this wrong. Mm -hmm. If you don't know the, the results of, of that entire panel, then you truly don't know the status of this woman's thyroid health. Yeah, it's so true. I see that very commonly in my practice here too. My nutrition practice is people come and say that they have thyroid issues, but then they aren't getting the full picture because they have TSH. Maybe they have a T4 if they're lucky, mm -hmm. but they're not looking right. at a free T3, reverse T3. There's a lot of other things that need to be checked to get that full picture. And it's so important for women Absolutely. to get that information about their bodies. Absolutely. And so if anybody out there had any of those symptoms that I just talked about, check out Stop the Thyroid Madness. That's not my website. It's ran by a, 
a wonderful lady who basically was a patient with low thyroid and went to, to I don't know, 20 or 30 doctors and didn't get any help, any advice, any any kind of treatment. And so it kind of, you know, it angered her and she decided to just become an expert on her own thyroid. And she pretty much did that. And I tell patients, after you've read on that website for a couple of hours, you will be smarter than the average doctor when it comes to thyroid. Mm-hmm. And so I highly recommend that website. And I've recommended it hundreds of times. But that's where it has to start is with checking a full panel of lab work, not just a TSH plus or minus a free T4. And in your practice, are you finding good success with women getting on a nice proper dose of thyroid medication and feeling a lot better and seeing results? Well, first of all, if you get them on the right kind of thyroid medicine, I don't I don't typically use levothyroxine or Synthroid because it's it is actually synthetic or fake T4. It's not mm-hmm. even real thyroid hormone. So I tend to use a, a desiccated thyroid like Armor or Nature or WP Thyroid, something like that. And usually women respond so much better to that. Mm-hmm. And so when we get that where it needs to be and get our thyroid labs optimized, and there's a range of normal for thyroid lab work. And let me talk about this for just a second. Because in the way I describe it to women is a Yugo is a car. And a Ferrari is also a car. And so there's a range of cars from Yugo to Ferrari, but they're all cars. They're all normal. And so for thyroid labs, there's also a range of normal. And do you, you know, a lot of doctors, once they get you up into the Yugo range of normal, then that's it. They won't increase your medicine anymore. But why would you not go ahead and increase a woman up to at least the Corvette, if not the Ferrari end of normal, so that she's feeling the best she can feel because her labs are still within normal limits? But a lot of doctors, as soon as you get up into the normal, you know, just the barely bottom end of normal, they won't increase your medication anymore. And I I disagree with that. I think as long as they're within normal limits, why not have them in the upper limit of normal so that they can feel the best and reap the most benefits from the thyroid medication that they're having to take every day? But, yeah, once you get them on a good desiccated thyroid, they usually feel so much better. But then we have to think back to our five-piece band. We've Mm -hmm. got the drummer doing really good now. But the other four guys, if they still suck, it's not going to be a good night of music. And so then we have to, we've already talked about the insulin and the cortisol, and now we've got the thyroid fixed, and now we have to start looking at the sex hormones. The dreaded sex hormones that will just yes. go awry at a moment's notice. <laughs> absolutely. And it's absolutely true. I've seen it over and over and over. A lot of times a woman can be quite young, but after she's had a baby or had a C-section or had some huge life-changing stressor, her ovaries will just say, sayonara, Mm -hmm. see you later, and just stop giving her the hormones that she needs to feel her best. And so I actually, I've written about most doctors think all a woman needs is estrogen. And even worse, they think all she needs is fake estrogen, Mm. like Primrin or Primpro or something like that, which have all been proven to increase your risk of breast cancer. I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. It's a proven fact. And they forget that women also used to make and still need progesterone and testosterone to be the complete woman that she used to be. And so I test for all those and I try to replace all those, if needed, with bioidentical hormones. And I try to get her in the upper end of normal, in the normal range, with bioidentical hormones. And typically at that point, once we fixed all that stuff, she feels better than she's felt in a minute. Oh my gosh. Such a nice equation, I guess. You know, it's kind of like a stepping stone through each one. But once you get them all optimized, then you're you're back to you. You're back to you again. And that's right. And I tell women all the time, because, you know, a lot of women are a little spooky about testosterone. It's like, I don't want to turn into some kind of, you know, fill in the blank. And I'm like, no, no, it's not going to do that. It just makes you the you that you used to be. Mm-hmm. And so if that, you know, if you used to be a crazy animal, then you might be a crazy animal again. But if you used to be whoever you used to be, that's that's who we're looking for is the you that you used to be. And we're not trying to turn you into some kind of animal or machine. We're just trying to make you who you used to be. Yes, exactly. And that's all most of us want, right? It's brand spotlight time on this episode. This one has been around in my world for a very long time and has pulled me out of some tough situations. It's the herbal remedy brand Wish Garden Herbs. I turn to Wish Garden tinctures for pretty much everything. When I'm getting sick, when I can't sleep, when I'm in a bad mood, when I'm stressed, when my stomach is upset, literally 
everything. They have one for every single thing you could ever be going through. Wish Garden has a special place in my heart ever since I went to tour the facility as they are a Boulder-based company. And I learned from the actual herbalist herself, the founder of the company, Catherine, all about what they do, what they use, why they use it, and why they do what they do. And it was absolutely fascinating. This truly is a company with heart. Their blends are each small batch crafted with the cleanest, most potent ingredients Mother Nature has to offer. They're organic and sustainably wild harvested. Catherine and her team of herbalists formulate each one carefully to maximize function for whatever is ailing you. What this all really means is that they work. They are so impressive. I can't even explain it. You just have to try it. The next time you have an ailment or something you want help with, with your health, these tinctures will replace any of the potentially harmful over-the-counter medications currently going on in your medicine cabinet. I am confident of that. They even have remedies for kids that is a super popular line for them as well. If you're not already a fan, you will be soon. Head to seanminer.com slash wishgarden and support this female-owned family-run business. Again, that's seanminer.com slash wishgarden. Okay, so can you talk a little bit in, in a little more detail about the difference between bioidentical and synthetic hormones? And if someone's on synthetic, maybe that's something they could bring up to their doctor's attention? Yeah, if you take estrogen in the form of a pill, or you take most progesterones in the form of a pill, or you take testosterone in the form of a pill, then you are increasing your risk of cancer and or liver failure. That's a that's a proven fact. There's no doubt about that. Let me tell you about the testosterone pill story, okay? There used to be a pill for men to take testosterone a couple of decades back. They could take a pill every day, and it would get their testosterone levels back to normal. It worked. There's no doubt. But doctors found that they were having increasing problems with liver failure, liver damage, liver enzyme elevation. And so after a little bit of research, they said, you know, this pill is too dangerous. Even though it works, we've got to take this off the market. And they did take it off the market. But here's the kicker. That same testosterone by mouth is still available for women to this day in a pill called Estratest, which is fake estrogen. And that very methyl testosterone that was taken off the market because it was too dangerous for the liver, for men's livers. But evidently, (laughs) women's livers are magically either not important or magically much, much stronger than men's. And I'm being sarcastic. Neither one of those is true. (laughs) This should have been taken off. (laughs) This should have been taken off the market for all humans. But somehow they forgot and left it in ester test. And so women still take this pill that's too dangerous for men to take. Oh, that's so sad. Right. And so the estradiol, primarin, primpro, these are all fake estrogens. They're not actually human estrogen. And they it's true, they, they get the initial molecule from horse urine, and then they change the molecule so that they can get a patent on it, right? That's how you make a profit in the Western world is you get a patent on something. But you can't get a patent on just pure estrogen, real estrogen, bioidentical estrogen, because it's a natural molecule that occurs in nature. And you can't patent nature. And so you have to change it. And so they'll stick a methyl group on it or a hydroxyl group, and then they can get a patent on that unique molecule. And that's what Primpro, Prim, Primarin, Estradiol, that's what they all are. They're not real. And they fit pretty closely in the receptor on the human cells. And therefore, you know, if women are having night sweats and hot flashes, it does help those symptoms. There's no doubt. But since it doesn't fit exactly, it also increases her risk of cancer, breast cancer, endometrial cancer, and perhaps even other cancers. And then if she's a smoker on top of that, it really skyrockets her risk of cancer. The beauty of the bioidentical hormones is that they are the exact molecule that your body used to make before your ovaries said sayonara, and therefore it fits perfectly in your receptor. And it's never been shown in any study that bioidentical hormones increase your risk of anything except feeling better. Mm. I'm so glad that you... That's why I love them. Yeah, that explanation was so great to understand the difference because a lot of women don't know. And it's definitely one of those things where you're just at the doctor's office and they tell you you need this, so you take it and you don't know the difference. That's right. That's right. And so the, the key is if you take a hormone pill, you need to take a hard look at that mm-hmm. because, and this is why I have to qualify it a little, 
there are some bioidentical progesterones. They're always going to be compounded at the pharmacy. They're mm-hmm. never going to come pre-made. So if you're taking a pre-made progesterone, then that's fake progesterone. That's not real. That increases your risk of cancer and other things. But if it's a compounded pill that's been made at a compounding pharmacy where they actually make medicine the old-fashioned way, then that's more than likely bioidentical and safe to take. There is no safe estrogen or testosterone pill on the Western market that does not increase your risk of cancer, stroke, other things. So you want to get your bioidentical hormones either from a cream that's absorbed through your skin there's a couple of ways that you can have it absorbed through the vaginal lining or other mucosal membranes. And then there's the bioidentical hormone pellets that are actually inserted under the skin in a small procedure in the office. Mm-hmm. But but bioidentical hormones don't come as a pill. Okay, got it. That's good to know. Okay, so let's move on from this discussion. Now I want to talk about this awesome book that you wrote. It's called Lies My Doctor Told Me. How did you come up with the idea for this book? Well, as you can maybe tell from listening to me talk, I don't just blindly accept anything mm-hmm. at face value. Every Everything I hear, I'm like, wait, now why is that true? Where's the research for that? Let me look at that study. And so that tends to infuriate you know, my colleague and my superiors when I was in medical training. But I feel like it served me pretty well at taking good care of my patients. Through the years, there have been multiple things that have popped up that I've heard another doctor say or that I've read. And I'm like, what? That can't be right. Is that true? Anything, first of all, that goes against nature or that says that nature's dumb and it doesn't know what it's doing or that the human body's dumb and it doesn't know what it's doing, immediately a red flag should go up and you should be like, wait a minute, what? Mm-hmm. That We've been on this earth for how long? And it's all been working because each one of us, and this is a good way, if you're suffering from low self-esteem, think about this. You, as your person, are the culmination of thousands of successful reproductions for the last how many eons. If one of those reproductive pairs had failed, you wouldn't be here. So you are literally the product of thousands of successes over the past eons and generations. And so the human body is obviously pretty smart and nature always makes sense. And so if you tell me, for instance, one of the lies I talk about in the book is that nuts and seeds are bad for people with diverticulosis and it could cause them to have a flare up of diverticulitis. So you're saying, wait a minute, nuts and seeds, two of the most healthiest things a human can eat, are now bad for some of us. And immediately when I heard that, I think I was in residence and I was like, that's weird. How does that even make sense? You know, Mm -hmm. but diverticuli are these little pouches that come off your large intestine. And we pretend we don't really know why people have them. But as you get older, you tend to have them more. Smokers tend to have more. Therefore, obviously, smoking tends to cause them. Makes sense. If you're overweight, you tend to have more. But the theory is that these little nuts and seeds and popcorn get caught in the little pouches, and that causes inflammation or infection, and that leads to diverticulitis. And you see how that sort of sounds like it probably is true on some kind of surface kindergarten level. (laughs) But there's actually a huge medical study that was done about this very question. 25,000-ish participants in this study, and you probably have read enough about this to know that the more participants in a study, the more power it gives you to predict based on what the results of this study were. Mm -hmm. And this study showed definitively that nuts and seeds have nothing to do with flare-ups of diverticulitis, basically they're actually protected. The more nuts and seeds that the participants ate, the less likely they were to have diverticulitis. But yet to this very day, last week, last Thursday, I had a lady come. She'd had a flare-up of diverticulitis, went to the emergency room, got treated, and she came to me and for follow-up. And I, she said, well, what should I do? What should I eat? And so I told her, you know, blah, 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 ketogenic, paleo, and make sure you're eating lots of nuts and seeds. And she said, but the ER doctor told me to never again eat nuts and seeds. Man. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Okay, so just ignore that because that's not true. And I keep a copy of this study printed out in my office because to this very day, even the the biggest gastroenterologist in my state still tell people this medical lie that they shouldn't eat nuts and seeds. And Mm -hmm. so I have to hand this study out. And so and I've underlined the pertinent parts and say, here, go home and read this. Then you can decide whether you're going to listen to him or listen to me. It's up to you. But the things that were actually shown to increase your risk of diverticulitis were smoking, being overweight, and eating lots of processed foods. Of course. But nuts and seeds had nothing to do with it. 
But yet doctors still to this very day, ER doctors, gastroenterologists, family doctors, internists, they still repeat this lie thoughtlessly and keep patients from eating foods that would ultimately help their health, not hurt it. Right, exactly. Okay, so what are some other lies? I'm sure there's a lot covered about cholesterol. So what do you think about cholesterol? Oh, yeah, I've got two or three chapters in the book <laughs> about that. And you're you're probably familiar with a gentleman by the name of Ansel Keys. Yes. And you've probably heard the entire story. But basically, in a nutshell, all of the, the fat will make you fat. Fat will lead to heart disease. High cholesterol will lead to heart disease. Every bit of that was based on one huge study that was started back in the 50s, completed in the 70s, called the Seven Country Study that was basically consisted of completely made-up data. He studied 22 countries, but he only published the data from seven countries. And I'm going to let your listeners guess why he picked those seven studies. You see, Dr. Keyes was a vegetarian. And so he really believed with all his heart that animal products, saturated fat were truly bad for you. And guess what is the research that he chose to publish showed? It showed that very thing. But he didn't publish all the research. He actually didn't publish over half of the research. And when you go back and crunch all the numbers in the 22 country study, it's actually sugar that led to increased heart disease, not fat. Fat was background noise. It really had no effect, good or bad. It was just like nothing. But sugar did have a positive correlation with heart disease. But that didn't fit into his vegetarian beliefs, and therefore it didn't get published. Isn't that just the saddest story? And then it's, it's really sad. But what's really sad, what's really, I mean, you know, you can't really fault one guy. I mean, he believed in vegetarianism very strongly. Okay. But he actually came along at this perfect storm of the time where the federal government was looking for dragons to slay and looking for big causes to get behind. And so they grabbed this because they'd actually sponsored a lot of his work. And they actually latched onto this, some congressmen and senators, and said, let's make this nationwide. Let's basically not enforce it, but let's make it this. These are the official guidelines of the U.S. government. And that's what they did. And so then any doctor, and there, back then there were multiple doctors who were saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's, let's do some more studies here. They were silenced because basically you either got on board or you got ran over as a doctor when this was happening. And so they just shut up and they, they rolled over and they let this happen. And so for the last 60 years, the U.S. and Canada have been operating under a completely false paradigm based on made up research by one guy that nobody ever bothered to verify. That's the really sad part, is that literally millions of people have taken billions of pills that they didn't need and have had unnecessary heart attacks and strokes and muscle aches and fatigue and muscle damage from taking medication that they didn't need and from not ingesting the nutrients that they did need. Yeah, That's just, literally what's been happening in the last 60 years. Just imagine if that data did come out way back then that the sugar was the correlating effect. Just think of how different our society right. would be, like how different our health situation would be now if you know we knew exactly. that information way back then. And then that is what was the culminating evidence. But instead, we now all have this fat fear from that one study. Mm -hmm. And it's, yes, and it's built in and it's hardwired. And I'll have people who, I've, like I said earlier, I've already had two or three office visits and talking about the ketogenic diet. And I'll say, well, okay, what have you changed in your diet? And lo and behold, they'll say, well, I've stopped eating butter. And I'm like, what? Why? Why mm -hmm. did you do that? <laughs> well, I'm trying to cut back on fat. Why? And so I have to kind of ask them these Socratic questions like, why, why, why? Until they finally go, oh, I should eat more butter, shouldn't I? <laughs> yes. So it's, it's, it's almost comical, but yet sad at the same time that it's almost a religious belief that we just feel like we're sinning if we give up that belief. That's how many, many people and many doctors think about the cholesterol theory and the fat theory of heart disease. It's a religious belief. And you can tell this if you start talking to someone, a doctor especially, and they start getting emotionally upset. When you're talking about this, because that means they're not being objective. That means they're not basing anything that they're saying on research or data. They're just getting emotional. And mm -hmm. that means they really don't have any support for what they're saying that they believe and what you should believe. They don't have any support for that. So they get emotional. And so anytime a professional starts to get upset like that, that's a red flag that he didn't have any data to back up what he's talking about. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's do one more myth. What's another good one that you cover in your book? Well, let's see. We talked about all that women need is estrogen. That's a big fat lie. We've already covered that. We've already covered the big fat lie of all you need to TSH for your thyroid. What about milk? Let's talk about Mm, milk. Yes, this is huge. Let's talk about that. Yeah, it's huge. So the reason, let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back in time, 30,000 years. Why do mammals make milk for their newborns? Why do they even do that? A lot of people don't really know this, but mammals have the most developed brain of all the animal kingdom. And that's why we control the world because we're the smartest of the different species the mammals are. But our brain has gotten so big so that we can be so smart that it's almost too big to fit through the birth canal. And so mammals have to be born almost prematurely to get through the birth canal before their head gets too big. And then that wouldn't go well, as we can imagine. So when they come out and, you know, some mammals are up and running in a few minutes, but the higher mammals, you know, are at the top of the food chain are helpless for months, if not a year or two. And their mother has to give them something that's going to help them grow and gain weight as quickly as possible. And what does she give them to help them gain weight as quickly as possible? Milk. Milk. Milk is the perfect weight gain food. That's what mammals use it for. And that's mammals within, they use milk from their own species. And when you start giving mammals milk from another species, you really accelerate the weight gain because the protein and fat percentages are off. The sugars are different. Everything's different. Milk is not a liquid. Milk is a liquid tissue. And people don't realize it. When you say it like that, it's like, oh, so it's actually much more complicated than just a liquid. Yeah, it is. It's a living tissue when it comes from a mother. And so if a human being is ingesting cow's breast milk, which that's what it is, but I like saying it that way because it makes it sound a little more gross, (laughs) that's not a healthy food for humans. That's to help calves grow and gain weight as quickly as possible. So we've been taught through beautiful advertising, marketing campaigns, milk does a body good, where's your milk mustache? And it's almost uh, most people who love and believe in milk, believe in it fervently, almost again, that religious belief. If you push them a little bit, they'll start to get emotionally upset Mm -hmm. because they know it in their heart, in their soul of souls that it's good for you. And you can't dissuade them from that. Facts be damned. Right. And so Mm -hmm. this is a very slow sell with a lot of people because they just don't want to believe it. But I'm sorry, but we are the only species on the planet that drinks liquid milk as an adult. No other animal does that unless humans give it to them. So for a doctor to say, oh, you should drink milk. It's good for you is silly because first, there's no research that shows that's true. And there's actually lots of meaningful research that shows that that's not true. Women definitely don't need to drink more milk to have stronger bones. I don't know if you've heard about the studies or not, but in the countries where the least milk is drank, they have the lowest rate of hip fracture. Oh, interesting. And in the countries, yeah, absolutely. And in the countries with the highest rate of milk consumption, which are Canada and the U.S., they actually have the highest rate of hip fractures anywhere in the world. And now that doesn't prove causation, but that's a pretty darn strong correlation that there are countries where women literally never drink any other milk except their mom's breast milk when they're babies. When they get old enough that they're weaned, they never drink one more drop of milk their entire life, and they have stronger bones than we do. How's that possible if milk makes your bones stronger? You see, I mean, logically, you have to stop right there because it obviously isn't true. And that's a big fat lie that lots of doctors tell their patients. And ultimately, they just lead their patients to weight gain and insulin resistance and ultimately type 2 diabetes because you're drinking all this milk sugar that wasn't even made for your body to start with, and you wind up with disease. Oh, my gosh. That's such a good one. I've never thought of it that way, but that's so true that no other mammal continues on drinking milk beyond the point of them you know, maturing into beyond baby. Exactly. And there's a tenet in nature when you're studying nature as an ecologist or whatever, that life will always find a way. That's number one. Number two, milk is a very concentrated source of nutrition, right? So if milk were good for adult mammals, there would be some kind of weasel or some kind of marmot or something. There would be some kind of mammal that would sneak into the nest of other mammals and suck their breast milk. Mm-hmm. there's a bird that lays his eggs in another bird's nest so he didn't have to take care of his babies. That's his strategy. 
And there's all these strategies in the animal kingdom of how to cheat and how to get by with nutrition from some source you really shouldn't be getting it from. But there's no mammal. There's no mammal that sucks the milk of another mammal. There's not a single example of that. And I think that that in and of itself is indirect proof that that's just not something that's healthy for adult mammals. We shouldn't do that. And I'll tell you, me personally, I grew up being a milk baby. When I played football in high school, I would drink almost a gallon of milk a day. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I also had terrible acne and chronic allergies, terrible, severe sneeze a hundred time allergies, a hundred times a day. I would just, you'd look at me and I would sneeze. And so when I got to college, I used to think it was because my dorm room was so dirty that my allergy said, we're either going to have to get over it or we're going to die. And they just got over it. But the truth <laughs> of the matter is, is I didn't have a fridge handy. So I didn't drink milk when I went to college. Mm. And so when I stopped the milk, my allergies went away and wow. also my acne went away. And I didn't even see that until two decades later when I was thinking about the milk thing for the first time. And I looked back on my own personal experience and I was like, wait a minute. When I went to college, I stopped drinking milk. And my allergies literally went away. And I was the guy that was taking three pills a day, three different medicines a day, trying to control my allergies and would still sneeze if you looked at me. And it stopped immediately when I stopped the dairy, when I stopped liquid milk. And so I think that's strong testimony that, at least for me, milk is not good for me. Yeah. And I don't think it's good for any adult human mammal. Oh, I love that. I feel like the keto ladies are going to have a hard time <laughs> with that information because there's a lot of <laughs> keto people out there that really rely on yeah. their dairy sources. Well, let, me, let me tell you, I love real cheese and I love heavy cream and I love, love, love butter. And I use those guys just about every day because it's the milk sugar that mm -hmm. leads to weight gain. And it's the inflammatory proteins in milk that deal with the allergies, the acne, the reflux, the GERD, those are the culprits. And so probably the most pristine way to live would be dairy-free. And I can't really argue with the logic of that. But I think that if you want some dairy, I think that real hard cheeses, real heavy cream, and real grass-fed butter, I think those are fine for the human animal because they're almost pure fat. Mm -hmm. And so I don't preach against those. But if you'd rather not have any dairy, I think that's fine. You can get your fat from another source. But it's not the fat in milk that's the problem. And so the very worst dairy product of all is skim milk. That is the devil of dairy products. Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Important distinction, though, that dairy that's pretty much all fat is a different caliber. Important distinction. Almost. A, yeah, I totally agree with that. But I think also if you have some listeners who are like, no, no dairy, I can't really argue with their logic. Yeah. Just get your fat from another source. But if you love butter, I love butter. I put mm -hmm. butter in my coffee every day. Mm -hmm. But personally, I don't have allergies. I don't have acne. I don't have those things that I used to have when I drink 2% milk. Right. And so my little study here of one guy, I do well on butter and heavy cream and real cheeses, but I did not do well at all on 2% milk. Yes. Big difference. Well, this was such an amazing conversation. You just gave our listeners so much to think about and definitely everyone go get the book, Lies My Doctor Told Me. It's more of this information broken down. You do such a good job of explaining all of this too. So it really gives people a place to start. And it's also important because I think this is a really good resource for people if they're trying to maybe teach others in their family or deal with some pushback that they're getting from their doctor or their loved ones or whatever. This is a great place to go, this book, so that you can kind of break down and give this information to people that don't yet know what we're talking about. Exactly. And you just because you believe it and you know it to be true doesn't mean any of your neighbors know it exactly. or believe it to be true. And so using the book for something like that, it's like, oh my gosh, I read this book. You should take a look at it. You might literally save a life by doing that. And that's one of the things I love the most about my job is you can change a person's life. You can save their life, but almost more importantly, you can make them have that happy, healthy life that they thought was gone forever. Mm -hmm, definitely. And you do also do long distance visits with people too, as kind of like a nutrition consultation type thing. Is that true? I do. Yes. I use a service called evisit.com and it's HIPAA compliant. It's, it's as safe and secure as online banking. And it's almost like FaceTime. 
where mm-hmm. we're looking at each other, talking to each other. And I have people from three different countries now and many people in the U.S. and Canada do this with me and say, OK, here's the medicine I'm on. Here's what my doctor said. Here's what my lab values are. What do you think I should do? And then we talk about that and we come up with a plan that they then take back with, to their doctor and say, hey, I want you to check these labs. And I'd really like to switch to this medicine or stop this medicine altogether. And here's why. Here's the research that I printed off. And again, like I said earlier, if your doctor gets uncomfortable or upset that you brought in something that you've studied and print off the Internet, that's a red flag. Maybe you should either try to train your doctor or maybe even find a new one because this is your one life. This is your one health. And if you ruin it based on the advice of one doctor, you and your family are going to suffer. He's not going to suffer. Mm -hmm. You will. And so it's your job to do your homework and to read and research and to take things to your doctor. And it's his job to listen to you and help you through this information and help you back towards the health that you used to have. So important. And where can people find you? Where else are you? Are you on the social medias and your website, all that stuff? Yeah, I've got a YouTube channel where I make videos about the ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting and all kinds of other medical and health and nutrition topics. And if you just search for me, you'll find me on YouTube, I think, pretty easily. But my handle is Kendi Berry MD, all one word. And then I have a Facebook page where I also post articles and I write little things and do some motivationary things. And I think my handle there is Kendi Berry dot MD. But you can search and find me pretty readily. And then on my YouTube channel and on my Facebook page, there's a link to the e-visit. If you want to talk to me face to face about a particular question you have about your health or medications or lab work, you can do the e-visit. All you have to do is click on the link that's on the Facebook or the YouTube. And I also have a Instagram and Twitter, but I don't use those much. You can search and find me if that's the way you like to be social. Love it. That's so great. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, and I do think, aren't we meeting in person in May on the Low Carb Cruise? Yeah, I think we're both speaking on the Low Carb Cruise coming up in 2018. I'm really excited to meet you there in person and hear your speech. Hear your Yeah, I know. That'll be really fun. And maybe we'll meet some listeners of the Keto for Women show too there. Love it. So great. Thank you so much for your time and for explaining all of that awesome info for our ladies out there. This has been a real pleasure. Let's do this again sometime. Yes, absolutely. Thank you.